Hi, my name is Maddie Hill and I'm a freshman here at UNL. I'm a biology major in the honors program. Um, I was very interested in taking this class, the anthropology, anthropology of Sport and Leisure, and I was beyond excited that I was actually able to take this class. Um, I thought I would just share some of my athletic and leisure interests because this is what this class pertains to. So I do enjoy working out in my free time, going to the rack, going to the gym. Um, I like running. I also like to play basketball and hockey as well. Um, Non-heart rate involved, more leisurely. I enjoy um, reading or watching TV or just hanging out with my friends. Um, and I'm also participating in the World Ethnography Project, so this is what I'm here to talk about today, the ethnography I chose. So the ethnography I chose to read is called Counting Coup, A True Story of Basketball and Honor on the Little Bighorn, and it was written by Larry Colton. Here's a picture of the book. Um, and it was published in 2000 by Grand Central Publishing. Fortunately, this book is actually available on Amazon for only about $15, so it's pretty accessible for most, and it, I know it was for me. So I'm really glad that I got to actually purchase the book and annotate it, so. Before I give a summary of the book, I think it is important to first establish some background information. This book takes place on the Crow Indian Reservation located in Montana. It is near Billings and Hardin, sort of closer to Hardin, and as a result of this, Crow Indians from the reservation attend Hardin High School. Crow Agency is sort of like the capital, if you want to call it, of the reservation. It's their political and cultural center, and about a thousand people live there, and it's like the main focal point of the book. This is where mainly Colton is going to draw his um, observations from. Crow territory has sadly been greatly reduced over the years, so if you think about it, at the time America was colonized by the British um, and even the French before them, um, various Native American tribes spanned the entire North American continent. And now when Colton wrote this book in the late 90s, they were only reduced to about 2.2 million acres. And this is just the Crow tribe, but over time as, as a result of westward expansion, Native American plots of land have just gotten smaller and smaller. Um, and there's a lot of government action in these areas and Colton ta talks about it a lot, but he also reports the severely high unemployment rate on the reservation, causing them to rely on the government heavily. Many men are alcoholics and domestic abusers. Um, their houses are dilapidated, litter, litter piles up in the streets, in general things are just very run down, as Colton reports. To contrast the nature of the reservation, Hardin itself, is, the neighboring city, is the, like the true the definition of the true American West, full of white farmers and cowboys, which helps to create this tremendous clash between both of these cultures. In addition, I thought it would be important to also identify what the title means, counting coup. Myself, I didn't know what it meant. And on the inside cover, actually, um, Larry Colton provided a definition. So counting coup is a way for young warriors of the Plains Indian tribes to gain honor and respect. There are four main ways to establish a coup. The first way is to touch an enemy in battle. The second way, to steal an enemy's horse. The third, to lead a successful war party. And fourth, to capture an enemy's weapon. But the bravest way to establish a coup is to merely touch the enemy on his chest. The more coups, the more honor you received and brought to your tribe in turn. And the chief was awarded to the warrior with the most coups. Lastly, I refer to the subjects in this book as Indians because that is how they wanted Colton to address them. The reasoning behind this is that they weren't actually native to America, but rather they were the first Americans. So they just prefer being called Indians. So I will uphold their wishes. Larry Colton was interested and fascinated about the plight of young American athletes as he reports in the book. Although they had many assets, including talent, intelligence, and athletic ability, they could not receive any athletic scholarships from colleges, and Colton wanted to find out why this was. Colton initially traveled to Crow Agency to write about three seniors on the Hardin High School boys basketball team, Norbert Hill, Paul Little Light, and Clay Dawes. However, this isn't the story that he writes about, and you'll see why. This seven-part book is about a small town High school girls basketball team's quest to the state championship, which mainly focuses on their star player and her story. Like I said earlier, Larry Colton initially traveled to Hardin, Montana in 1994 to write about three standard standout players on the boys basketball team. That all changed when he saw Sharon LaForge, a 17 year old Indian girl playing basketball on the opposite end of the court in which he was watching the boys play. 
Her ease, her natural talent, and her athleticism, and even her demeanor, roped Colton in from the start. Throughout his 15-month stay on the Crow Indian Reservation, Colton got to know not only Sharon and the other players on the team, but also people from the reservation and people from Hardin too. He embarked on the team's quest for the state title. He celebrated the wins, he endured the losses, experienced the drama and the hardships, witnessed the joy and excitement of camaraderie, but most importantly, he gained the girls' trust. He gained their, their trust by essentially becoming an honorary 17-year-old girl, as he put it in the book, in forging special bonds with the players, especially Sharon, he was also determined to uncover some of the history on the deep conflicts existing between whites and Indians and to uncover truths about living life on the reservation. Not only was he this 17-year-old girl, but he also worked to completely try and assimilate himself into Crow culture and lifestyle by participating in rituals like sweats and by attending different sorts of festivals and feasts. In doing this, he also gained the trust of the tribes, tribes people, which was his inn, allowing him to stay and write with about them. In fact, he was recognized and liked by so many on the reservation that by the end, Colton was actually adopted into the tribe, and he was Sharon's clan uncle. Beyond all else, this story is a roller coaster of emotions, a heartbreakingly true tale of a girl with an extraordinary talent growing up in the face of adversity. Well, I mentioned his name a lot, so I might as well give you some information about him. Pulitzer Prize nominated author Larry Colton, nominated for Khan and Coup, has published five books and hundreds of magazine and newspaper art articles in his 40-year writing career. He played baseball on a full scholarship at the University of California, Berkeley, and he was eventually drafted by the Philadelphia Phillies of the MLB. He pitched once but got into a fight which injured his shoulder and prevented him from ever pitching in a, on a major league mound ever again. While playing in the minors and also a little bit of professional baseball, he was also teaching and writing. Some of his articles were also picked up by well-known newspapers and magazines, including Sports Illustrated, which eventually launched his writing career. Even though I no longer play basketball at the organizational level that I used to, I've played my entire life and I still do. Um, I'm extremely passionate about it. So when I read the summary for this book, my heart was set on reading it. I was interested in not only the story of Sharon and the, basket and the impact of basketball on the Native American tribes and culture, but I was also interested about the history of the past and what kind of like led to the downfall and the, the plight of a Native American athletes, as Larry Colton put it. We don't, we're not taught stuff like that in school. You're not like, we don't get to look into reservations. So that's why I was really interested about something like this. My personal critique of this book, while I loved it, being flat out plain and simple, I found myself laughing, I would find myself crying. I also related to his accounts of Coach Mack. She was the girls um, basketball coach and she sounded just like my high school coach. So I was truly invested in this story. Even if you don't know much about basketball, you'll find yourself loving it, following along intently and, intently and rooting for the Lady Bulldogs. So I hope you check it out. This book even connects to topics we discussed in anthropology. Um, the biggest theme I gathered from this book was about sort of correlated with connecting race, racial tension, and racial discrimination. Since Colombian colonization, there has been loads of tension between whites and Indians, Indians receiving the brunt of this tension. As a result, their land, their culture, and their way of life really suffered. As white people expanded westward, more and more land was taken from Indians, as I mentioned earlier, and all the while they were forced to assimilate to white culture in order to survive. The problems then, from then, still continue to this day, on reservations, in places like Hardin, where it is clear that the conflicts between whites and Indians are not going anywhere anytime soon. Because of this tension, Indians face lots of discrimination. One example from the book is that immediately comes to mind is that when the Lady Bulldogs were playing against Billing Central, the fans kept yelling racial slurs at Sharon, telling her to go back to the res. Another big theme was gender. Discussed in the book, Native American women do not historically have a lot of power or status on the reservation. Approaching the 21st century, when this book was written, things started to change a little bit. Sharon was this phenomenal female athlete, um, and it only helped to shine a positive light on the rising status of women during that time. Another, men pers another person in the book that was mentioned was Janine Windyboy. 
She was an, an Indian woman in charge of running the Little Bighorn College, a college exclusively for Native Americans. Many men on the reservation felt threatened by her because of her knowledge and her capabilities. So they even attempted to vote her out of, posi out of her position, which they ultimately failed. On a smaller scale too, um, ritual rituals and magic were also came up quite a bit. Um, for example, sweats are a tradition in Native American um, culture, and I will discuss this when I talk about my passage. Another thing was sprinkling your sage into your shoes for good luck, which Sharon and a lot of her teammates did. Um, Sharon's Aunt Marlene also liked to place good medicine, as she calls it, onto different gyms that the Lady Bulldogs would play. Before I read my passage, I thought it would be important to introduce it so you sort of know where I'm coming from. Like I mentioned above, sweats are a big deal in crow culture. Crow culture. The point of them is to take a person through pain beyond his or her physical being into another realm. It is in this space that crows believe wisdom, healing, and spiritual strength are found. Prayers are heard. By participating in a sweat, you can bring good fortune to a loved one. So in this passage I'm about to read, Colton, Sharon's grandpa Blaine, and two others important to Sharon, participate in a sweat to honor her and bring her good luck for the season to come. This passage begins on page 79 with Colton speaking. In preparation for my sweat, I had to read up on the ritual, learning that the purpose of the sweat lodge is to take a person beyond pain, beyond his or her physical being into another realm. It is in this indefinable space that crows believe that wisdom, healing, and spiritual strength are found and prayers are heard. A sweat is good medicine, which is defined as anything improving one's connection to the great mystery and to all life. Sacrificing one's physical comfort is somehow supposed to bring healing and good fortune to the family, friends, and fellow creatures. The medicine from this sweat is for Sharon. In the twilight, Blaine and two other men, both built like bears, each with jet black ponytail down to his waist, are stripping naked. I haven't met any of them, saying nothing, Blaine nods in my direction, gesturing me to take off my clothes and put them in on a nearby bench. But shouldn't we get to know each other first? I skipped a few paragraphs and now I'm on page 80. Blaine's real passion, however, is watching his granddaughter play basketball. More than anything in his life, he wants her to excel on the basketball court, to bring honor and dignity to the family, to count coup in the ways of his ancestors, and to help ease the sadness he's carried with him since the day his only son was murdered. It had been eight years since his last drink, his sobriety not coming through AA or a treatment center, but by the aid of a major spiritual resource, the sweat lodge, he had concluded that unless he quit drinking, he would lose his marriage. Donetta had already stopped. To help in his recovery, he built the sweat lodge, not only to share with his family and friends, but to retreat to every day in search of a higher voice. For years, he was a deacon in the Crow Baptist Church, a regular on Sunday mornings, but falling out, a falling out with the minister during his drinking days drove him from the church. Now the sweat lodge is his pr place for prayer. And this particular sweat is extra special, not because he's joined by a white guy he's never met before, but because the sweat is to ensure success in the season ahead for Sharon, his pride and joy. He's as anxious as she is for the conference season to begin. I chose this passage because I thought it represented most of the themes and overlying background information that I touched upon throughout this video. I found it so crazy that although Colton hardly knew Sharon, let alone these other strange men he was forced to strip in front of, that he was so willing to participate in something so personal, spiritual, and important. It really emphasizes his efforts to move beyond his own life and his own experiences and to immerse himself into this completely foreign environment. It was also at this point in the book where I had sort of become like hooked, so to say. Well, that would have to wrap it all up. Thank you so much for watching me review and discuss this book. I really enjoyed making this video. I really enjoyed reading the book. So I really hope that you will take my thoughts into consideration and consider purchasing this book to read it. I would really recommend it.